Hello and welcome to the Best Practices Summit. Pollinator Friendly Alliance is a grassroots 501c3 nonprofit that protects the natural world through the conservation of pollinators. Our co host is the Xerxes Society, a science based nonprofit. Wonderful. Well, I just want to start off by saying thank you, uh, Lori, uh, Pollinator Friendly Alliance, as well as the Society for um, fostering uh, the summit this year. Um, look forward to it each year and uh, continue to grab uh, important concepts from some of the other speakers and apply it to my work each year. Uh, so I appreciate that. I don't always get that in, in other um, settings. So thank you for that. Um, here's the outline of what I'd like to cover. Um, my name is Dan McSwain and I work as a natural resource coordinator in the Washington County Park System. And um, in my line of work, I work on trying to improve the habitat uh, within the park system. So increasing that biodiversity that we have been talking about throughout the conference. Here's an outline of the presentation. I'll be going over acknowledgement. Um, overview of some of the practices that we're using that are different than um, some of the other practices that are out there. And we're gonna, I'm gonna rely heavily on video and photos that uh, Pollinator Friendly Alliance actually was able to provide throughout the growing season. Uh, so for those not familiar with the Washington County Park System, we are east of St. Paul, Minneapolis. Uh, the Mississippi River is our southernmost border and the St. Croix River is the eastern border. Um, it consists of over 12 parks and trails. Uh, we're part of the Metropolitan um, Regional Park System. And the work that I'm gonna show you uh, today of the habitat restoration occurring is the purple circles. So up at Pine Point Regional Park, Lake Elmo Park Reserve, which is over 2,100 acres and then St. Croix Bluffs Regional Park, which is close to 600 acres. Acknowledgement, I mentioned Xerxes Society, Pollinator Friendly Alliance. Also want to mention Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment. For those who are out of the state of Minnesota, uh, this amendment was passed in 2008 and has been a large part of the habitat restoration work that is occurring throughout the state of Minnesota. Without it, a lot of this, uh, the information that you see today wouldn't be happening. Also want to thank Washington Conservation District, South Washington Watershed District, and Wild Rivers Conservancy, uh, which helped with one of the uh, restoration projects that you'll see. Other resources that I really want to acknowledge are on that bottom left, um, especially um, Grassland Restoration Network, Prairie Enthusiasts, um, a lot of great um, a lot of great people out there that are fostering conversations. So thank you to all that are doing that. Uh, what are we gonna cover? So starting with pra prairie restoration. Okay, normally uh, when it comes to a prairie restoration, uh, we are converting a corn soy rotation into prairie. And ideally it is usually soybeans and we plant right into it very easy, have great prairies. Um, but I'd like to highlight a couple different ones using some of the Xerxes Society materials. One is um, uh, the Xerxes Society organic site method uh, preparation and using the soil inversion method in some of our areas that are like uh, Kentucky bluegrass, smooth brome uh, with minimal pollinator resources. So how does that work? We'll show you some video out in the field of um, one of the companies in Minnesota doing that work. Um, the second one, so I talked about normally we convert um, our cropland into prairie uh, after soybeans. Well, we had an instance in this uh, last upcoming year where it was gonna be corn um, or it had just previously been corn, uh, but we needed to get it into prairie to help uh, increase water quality. So what I mean by that is reducing uh, phosphorus loading um, into the St. Croix River. So we looked at doing a cover crop to help reduce our residuals um, and then plant into it um, later on, which will be shown in the video. Uh, one of the things to those who you're only doing a corn soy 
and then plant prairie rotation. Um, even if you do that only, I'd encourage looking into arbuscular uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, that's something that I'll talk about in the video that you'll see later. Um, and that being a missing component in these uh, cropland rotation systems that um, have been wiped out of one of the most important um, animal kingdoms. Um, prairie enhancement, again, uh, looking back at some of the Xerxes Society materials. For a lot of the work that we're doing, we have relied heavily on those materials. So thank you, Sarah, Eric, and others that have worked uh, tremendously to help provide the base for us to make this happen in the field. So we'll be looking at some interseeding into mixed cool warm season grass prairie restorations, um, interse interseeding into a warm dominated prairie restoration, which will be highlighted in the video. Uh, if you have questions about that process, please put that in the Q&A, especially as it relates to haying, um, if you have questions. And then um, oak savanna restoration. Uh, I'm going to talk about our process of removing shrubs in those areas and restoring that oak savanna uh, plant community um, following an IPM approach, and that being using cultural, biological, uh, mechanical and chemical as part of that um, approach to enhancing that area. Uh, what makes this different than what's out there? Um, I'm, we're trying to integrate the use of cover crops more following the initial removal of buckthorn uh, instead of just having a, a layer of seedlings continue to come up and um, having to be treated. So we're trying to use cover crops. You'll see some of that in action. And then I'll also cover a little bit of the nuances that we've uh, been working with when it comes to goats and browsing the buckthorn. And this kind of gets at some of the questions that I saw in previous presentations about uh, intensity and use of goats and uh, the thought process, processes behind that intensity. Um, and then uh, last, I know there was a video earlier in the presentation on the fungi um, being used on buckthorn. I could maybe touch on that a little bit more. Uh, so with that, um, could we please start the video? And Dan, if you want to pause the video at any point, just say pause and we can. Wonderful. I'll probably do that seven times. So this is the project that I was talking about earlier. Uh, the soil inversion method in action out at Lake Elmo Park Reserve where we're trying to restore eight acres of currently um, Kentucky bluegrass smooth brome dominated grassland into a diverse prairie. Um, this is a video footage of the first part of that process and that's burning off the existing vegetation in the fall. I believe this was probably December actually. It was a very late season burn. Uh, and then come spring, uh, it was followed up by uh, using a mold bore plow and to, to flip it over and uh, allow for it, to, uh, for it to break down. And that is an art in of itself, uh, which um, it takes a while to get used to and making sure that the, it doesn't bunch up behind the tractor. The next step in that process after waiting a while uh, to let the rain break down was using a disc and that had to be done three to four times. Um, and just pause right here, please. It, that was followed, uh, this is a little different. So within the Xerxes uh, Society steps, uh, it talks about the use of, or planting immediately following disking. And as part of this process, we actually wanted to try to uh, seed um, oats and, and take more nutrients out of the system and also use it as a smother crop uh, to help future weeds. Um, fortunately, we this was part of the process and I think in the long run it will help uh, because we ended up having a very long dry spell which reduced the amount of oats that actually came up. So that made me question, you know, if we did if we had planted the prairie when we did, uh, would it have been as successful? Uh, so this is what it looks like uh, 
a few weeks after the oats were planted following the disking. So it, it's not coming in that great. We decided to make the decision to hold off on planting uh, that fall and let this come up followed by mowing, which you'll see in the following video. Uh, please continue. So this is being mowed. That's how high it got come fall. And this was followed by disking. Um, disking and then planting this last fall. And this picture is at another, or this video is at another location on site, uh, but it shows the Truax planter being used. Uh, this picture here shows a previous conference. I talked about us using the soil inversion method and what it looked like. Unfortunately, at that conference, I only had snow pictures, but as you can see, this took a, a bluegrass smooth brome dominated field and made it into a diverse prairie. On next project, uh, this is at St. Croix Bluffs Regional Park where we were converting uh, 18 acres of cropland into um, a prairie. Um, and as part of this, we were looking to reduce phosphorus loading into the St. Croix River. As you can see in this, we're also uh, testing out new Board of Water and Soil Resources uh, conservation seed mixes uh, by doing a fall planting as well as a, a spring planting. And as mentioned previously, one of the challenges with this was that I, I do not like planting in the corn. And so that's why we were open to using the cover crop process here at us uh, to reduce our weed coverage and then reduce the herbicide residuals, which we didn't know because the history of, because we had just uh, purchased the property. Um, so we tried seeding uh, oats and what we found out we were doing at about 72 pounds per acre. We found it out that we needed to be a lot higher and you can see we were using a broadcast spreader there that we were just adjusting our other one had broke down, but that cover crop didn't come in as dense as we wanted. Uh, we were actually thinking about planting into it after harvesting. So we had to do an audible and we planted sunflowers and we reached out to a local farmer. Uh, here's a picture of the sunflowers coming in again acting as a smother crop trying to reduce the weeds. Absolutely gorgeous coming in. I, I wish we had more sunflowers in the parks. We had a lot of great comments. I think we actually even had a photo of the sunflowers to make our vehicle permit uh, finalist. Uh, pause, please. And for that, with the sunflowers, the other um, the other concept that I wanted to touch about touch on is that uh, we are a little concerned with how that planting medium would be following um, harvest of the sunflowers. So what we ended up doing was we came in with a flail and we mowed uh, the sunflowers and chopped it up. And uh, one of the restoration companies in Minnesota that we use is uh, MNL. They came in and they used a true ax to plant right into it. And to my knowledge, there was no issues. So um, it, we do anticipate some volunteer sunflower seedlings to come up uh, next year, but uh, we also didn't think this would be an issue because we would be mowing throughout the year. Typically we try to get in three to four mowings throughout the year. Uh, to ensure that enough sunlight's getting down to those uh, newly established seedlings. Uh, the other thing that uh, I've been trying to integrate into our, our corn soy prairie restorations is using a product. Um, we've used a product from Mycobloom 
and its endomycorrhizal fungi, fungi or arb barbiscular fungi, um, and restoring that fungi into these prairies that um, have been wiped out over the use of herbicides over the years. And um, what they recommend is trying to get over 150 pounds per acre. And when you look at that, it's about six bucks a pound. And if you were to just focus on that acre, um, it would be about $900 per acre. So in my mind, I'm like, that's not feasible. We don't spend that much. I mean, sometimes we don't even spend that much on seed. So how can we spread that out and make it more uh, manageable? And one of the things that we uh, have been do what we did on one of our prairies is that we incorporated that blue five gallon bucket, which is about 45 pounds into the back of the Truax in that uh, cover, uh, cover crop planting box. And we only put it in one of the bins. And the thought with that was, um, and we use that over 48 acres and by only putting it in a third or even less than that, a fifth of the box, we could spread that fungi out across the whole area. And if that fungi establishes, it grows at a rate of, I believe it's three meters a year. And you can learn more about this. I'm not an expert. Uh, in the fungi, I just know that it's important in the system. Uh, but on Michael Bloom's website, Liz Koizo has done an incredible job of bringing the importance of these fungi into uh, prairies. And I we used it back in 2019. And normally, I don't see like some of the plants that I was seeing, I never see until like later on. And I saw it in year two, which was just absolutely incredible. So that made us start to look into this more and use it on other projects as well. So something to look into for those who are even doing more traditional, you know, corn, soy plant, uh, planting prairies. Uh, please continue. And we do uh, just mention that we do use our own staff to plant uh, the prairies or maintenance workers. And so that's a time that we're able to kind of integrate, you know, what the natural resource work is. And they really love uh, learning about the process as well. As, as you all know, using a true X is an art um, based on weather conditions, feel, condi everything. So uh, the other thing I wanted to, touch about on habitat restoration work in the parks is prairie enhancement. Some of the work when it comes to interseeding, this is a project that happened, um, it, please pause right here. Um, back in 2017, we received a grant for um, from the Outdoor Heritage Fund as part of the Clean Water Land and Legacy Amendment. And it was to enhance um, prairie out at Lake Elmo Park Reserve. And how we went about doing this is a very similar to what they recommend in the Xerxes Society manual. And what we did was we had a later season spring burn in May, uh, followed by a very light disc at like 50 foot intervals in between. So that way we weren't opening up too much ground, uh, followed by broadcast seeding. Um, and that broadcast seeding was just, you know, me walking down the row and just hand broadcasting. And um, that, and then we had one mole followed in the following summer. Uh, please continue. So that was like five years ago now. And getting that seed out at first, you're like, okay, is it coming? First years we see it. And yes, it came up. And this last year, we were out looking at a couple of the projects and you see all that lupin coming in that wasn't there before. And it was just very exciting, exciting to see and kind of rejuvenates you, which you always get in the spring. Uh, these are the species that established from that mix. Uh, and many of which are in the Xerxes Society manual for what they've seen talking to practitioners about what species are establishing. So. But it also takes time to see this too. So some just wanted to reiterate that, that 
it's not always going to come up in your year two, year three. Sometimes it takes four to five years so you, for you to visibly see the difference that it's making. Listen to that life in the background. Got to love it. Uh, another project um, where we've done interceding is with Pollinator Friendly Alliance up at Pine Point Regional Park. And this involved a very similar method except for a light disc in the fall. Uh, followed by seeding in the winter. Uh, here's the, the species that were interseeded into it and some which were planted using uh, Pollinator Friendly Alliance volunteers out on site. Um, this shows the planting plan and it actually went, most of the light disking went east to west. Um, and then the, there's a picture uh, or picture of the volunteers that made it out there. And spiderwort was out there before, but Lori takes great pictures, so I'm glad she included that. But uh, also wanted to mention that PFA volunteers are also um, continuing to monitor um, the pollinators out in the prairie right now. Uh, please pause here. Uh, one of the other things that we did at Pine Point was uh, we worked with a local farmer to bail, um, bail the prairie in the fall in, in the dormant season once it, um, I think it was November timeframe. So we have frozen ground, came in, he bailed it and he actually ended up uh, using it for bedding material. And I think he was getting about $60 a bale at the time to make it worth it for the equip running the equipment and out on the field. And why did we do this? Um, we did this in replacement of burning, which for the last two years, we haven't been allowed to burn unless uh, government agencies haven't been allowed. If you're a contractor, you've been able to. Um, but this is something that we did to try to reduce our grass competition. Uh, the, this last year, it was, um, you know, we had drought, so that has an impact on species, but I did believe that this helped in reducing some of the grass dominance on sandy slopes um, throughout the site and kind of increase that uh, vegetation structure. So overall, I'd like to try to implement more haying in the park system. Um, however, one of the barriers uh, from a farmer's perspective is that, are there rocks out there? How bumpy is it? And it doesn't make it um, a worthwhile for them to go out. So we need to, we'd like to try to burn more and, and then put out a, a RFQ or, or bid to say, hey, here's the land. This is kind of what it looks like. Would you be interested in the future uh, in doing this? Um, otherwise, um, there's also contractors. I believe last year, uh, Lambridge was talking about the use of haying. And that may be something that we need to integrate into the parks as well. So haying followed by seeding is also another approach that uh, I believe is mentioned in Xerxes. Emmanuel, uh, please continue. So this is out at Lake Elmo Park Reserve where we're doing some oak savanna restoration work. Uh, this video is showing a, a site right after buckthorn removal. And one of the, the different things that we were doing this last uh, year and this is based off of previous pilot studies, was using a cover crop in some of the more open areas to seed prior to leaf out. So ice off the lake um, comes off and then there's a little time where soil temps get to like 55 and then we planted. And this was followed by goats, which I'll talk about coming up. Hello, we're out here after the goats have been through uh, this oak savanna restoration. Uh, we're here to show you a few things that the goats have done. Number one, the goats have made it easier to walk through. 
and um, pick up some of the down debris that occurred uh, during the removal process with the forestry mower and hand crews cutting. So we took this debris and made piles out on site. And uh, the other thing that happened is that the goats browsed the plants that we didn't want to see um, out compete everything else. So the goats browsed the buckthorn in the honeysuckle and they set it back to a state where it's only uh, knee high. Other buckthorn that's been removed and hasn't been grazed right now is upwards at the chest level. So when you have taller buckthorn, it makes it harder for follow-up uh, remover uh, removal in the future. Uh, so next steps in here is that we're going to set back uh, these shrubs uh, either through uh, spot mowing, spot um, treatment, uh, or uh, just the use of the goats again next year. So. Another question that often comes up with the goats is what do they like uh, and what do they don't like to eat. Uh, the goats will eat mostly everything in the paddock. There's a couple things that they don't like to graze. One is a sedge, which is in front of us on the ground. On, uh, it's called Pennsylvania sedge. Uh, they, they, they'll eat it a little bit, but not that much. And that often persists after the goats go through. The second plant that they um, don't like to eat is uh, Jack in the Pulpit, which is right here. And that is often left behind uh, from the goats, but everything else will be eaten. Um, the other item with the goats when it comes to the grazing and how often or how far we push them, we like to push the goats as far um, as intense as possible so that they're browsing everything back down to the ground and you're even getting some, uh, some of the twigs to be eaten back. Hello, we're out here at a site that was grazed two times last year and this is what it's looking like. Uh, you'll see many of the natives have bounced back. We have some uh, ferns right here in the foreground and you can also note and see that the buckthorn is still stunted. It's about knee high maybe a little bit bigger than knee high and it, this is july uh, 8th right now or, or 7th one of the two and we're still going to follow up with the mowing and set it all back here this upcoming year so this is a site that has not been grazed um, this year currently but it was grazed two times last year with a 30-day rest in between uh, grazes Hello, we're out here at a Oak Savannah Restoration beginning phases. Uh, one of the things that we like to do after the buckthorn and honeysuckle is removed is uh, put down a cover crop. And so we put that cover crop down once soil temperatures reach about 50, 55 degrees in the spring and right before leaf, the oaks and other trees leaf out. So we, we use a broadcast spreader uh, and have a very high seeding rate with the oats. And you can see the oats right in front of me in the foreground. And those oats will come in thick and out compete some of the other uh, seedlings and um, like buckthorn seedlings that we don't want to see. And here's one of the mixes that we also have tried to get in. And this is MNL buckthorn replacement mix. It's also talks about, talked about University of Minnesota cover it up program. Uh, many of the species there we've seen successfully established in other areas.